Welcome to uh, another Frosty Drew Live on YouTube. Uh, tonight we are just doing an online event uh, only, and uh, that's because of weather. Uh, we were hoping for good weather and to be able to do this from Frosty Drew, um, but that uh, experiment will have to wait for another Friday night. Uh, as usual, we are always doing something a little different with our YouTube um, series to see what people like and uh, see where things can go. Um, so tonight we have myself, Derek, uh, we have Scott, and we have Mara, and uh, we're going to go through uh, some pictures that uh, we took, our images that we've taken over the, the past couple weeks, um, and see how things go from here. Um, so as per usual, if you've watched this before with me, uh, you'll know that um, I, I work from my desktop, which is on my left here, and I use this uh as my camera, and that's just the way it works. Um, so I'm gonna start tonight, and we're gonna look at um, a picture of um, M83. Um, let me share that out really quick, and then we'll go from there. Where'd you go? All right. So everybody should be able to see this picture of uh, M83. Um, this is known as the Southern Pinwheel. Um, and I actually had to go out to Frosty Drew on Tuesday night to capture this image, uh, dodged a few clouds. And this is about uh, 40 minutes of data collection. And um, it was a pretty good night uh, at Frosted Drew on Tuesday night, so we had a little bit of fun, uh, me and another one of the volunteers. Uh, and this is located kind of near the constellation Corvus, um, over towards Hydra. And um, if, you have, if you're if you ever out during the summer, we sometimes look at this with the 8-inch telescopes. It's a fairly bright um, galaxy. You can kind of see the core. The core is very bright, uh, and then it has a nice bar and then the uh, the spiral arms kind of go off from there. So this is a barred spiral galaxy. Um, and because we can see it, uh, it is considered face on. Um, and it's also one of the larger galaxies um, that's close by. Um, and then it's also considered a grand spiral um, galaxy just because it has the very nice spiral arm structure and there aren't a lot of um, anomalies within that spiral structure. So, um, let's see. From there, maybe a little later tonight if I get it processed, uh, we can look at a different galaxy that I took Tuesday night. Um, but if we wanna jump over to, so I'm gonna, it's, it's gonna be a little bit of a teaser with all of these images that I have. Uh, but we're going to go down here to another one of the uh, Grand Spiral galaxies. Um, this one is M101, and this is in the Big Dipper uh, off of the end of the handle and towards, towards the North Star. If you go to the end of the handle and then go towards the North Star uh, by about the distance, uh, about half the distance between the last two stars in the handle, you'll run into this galaxy. Um, and this one you can see has, uh, no bar, um, but it, it has, you know, very nice spiral arms. And then this, this spiral arm goes well off the edge of the frame. Um, and I would have to kind of offset the, uh, the galaxy here to capture that. Um, but one of the things that I liked about M101 is you can start to see some of the, the star clusters, uh, within the galaxy itself. Uh, in these spiral arms and you know that's that's just really kind of shows how large those star clusters are uh oh <laughs> little giant white box over here on my other computer um, but yeah I just thought it'd be cool to start with the two uh, grand spiral design galaxies that are out there invisible in the spring sky uh, both of these we, we can see with telescopes that Frosty drew um, and if you're ever out on a Friday night, we can try and check them out. Now, Derek, we're, we're looking at a lot of these, these galaxies that you're imaging. And why is that such a big deal for springtime? 
Um, so the spring is sometimes called um, galaxy season. And that is because the Virgo supercluster, uh, which is in the constellation Virgo, uh, which is just to the east of the constellation Leo, is present in the sky. Um, and within that field of view, uh, the Virgo supercluster, there are thousands of galaxies. Um, a couple, I mean, even a couple dozen um, that we have on the Messier object list. Um, this image that I'm showing you now is, is a wide field of the center of the Virgo supercluster, and every single green circle is a galaxy, with maybe one or two exceptions. Um, and they range from Messier objects to other obscure catalogs um, that are used to catalog the objects in the night sky. Um, this, this series of galaxies here, this is called uh, Markarian's chain. Uh, and then off the end of Markarian's chain over here, you've got M88, which is a rather large galaxy. Up here at the top of the frame is M90, which is another large galaxy. Um, right here in the middle is M87, and that's commonly called the Virgo galaxy because it's basically considered the center of the Virgo supercluster, uh, at least optically. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing to me that there's that many galaxies in just one tiny field of view. And I say this is a tiny field of view, but uh, off the... It was uh, the Hubble Deep Field, which is a much, much, much smaller field of view, um, but much longer data acquisition probably shows many, many more galaxies. Um, and that's even a, it's a different area of the sky off of the edge of the Big Dipper. So I don't know if you had anything to start with, Scott, um, if you wanted to. Sure. So I'm actually going to switch over to the moon, which we wouldn't actually be observing tonight at Frosty Drew because the new moon happens on Sunday night at around, I think it's 10.33, 10.23 p.m. Eastern time. And that would have put us into an excellent night to look at the kind of objects that, that Derek has been presenting, galaxies. And springtime is a fantastic time for looking at galaxies. We just don't often see them in New England because it's cloudy. But this year, and then even though tonight, you know, we're getting clouded out, we got clouds, we got fog on in the forecast. I'm not complaining because I feel like the, the amount of clear nights we've had this spring has been blowing the doors off of what we've seen in the past spring times over the last few years. Typically, what well, we, we make a joke at Frosty Drew, we go from seeing, you know, Orion right in the southern sky to seeing the Milky Way, because the entire springtime sky we miss as a result of just continuously clouded out nights due to the wet springtime in New England. This year, not the case. And we've been out there, as you can see with Derek every week, he's got new galaxies. We've been out there as much as we can, just sucking it up. So, but tonight I'm going to show you right now a really excellent image of the moon. Now, this was not captured at Frosty Drew Observatory. This was captured at Brown University's Lad Observatory. And now, let's see here. Let's see if we can bring it up real quick here. All right. There we go. So Lad Observatory has a really fantastic old school 1891 Brashear 12 inch refracting telescope. Now, when we're talking 12 inches of aperture, you think, you know, 12 inches of aperture. I got that in the Dobsonian sitting in my basement. But when you're talking of a, that, a Dobsonian is a Newtonian reflector, when you're talking about a refractor, 12 inches of aperture is huge. That telescope wouldn't fit in the Frosty Drew Observatory, not even 
by a long shot. And that refractor has an extremely slow focal ratio. I'm not going to get too much into detail on what that means. But in general, what it means is that it takes a long time for the light to get from the point that it enters the telescope to the point that you can actually focus on it. And that allows for really fantastic views of really bright objects, objects like the moon, like binary stars, like the planets. And this is one example of the, the level of detail we can see in that telescope. And this was captured during the Physics 220 lab that we were giving one night at Lab Observatory. And the scene conditions were just phenomenal. So what we're looking at in this image here this here is Maria Imbrium. This here is Plato Crater. This is Maria Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. This is the Ocean of Storms. And then down over here is Maria Tranquillitatis on the edge, the Sea of Tranquility. This dark region right here is called Mare Vaporum. And you've got a series of mountain ranges right here. So. This over here, these are the Montes Alps. And then these are the, Monte, the Montes Apennines. And when you're looking at these mountain ranges, you're really just looking at a very large impact crater, a very old impact crater that occurred about four and a half billion years ago during a period when the lunar mantle was still molten and that lava had, you know, pulled back into those impact craters that broke open the crust. And that's why they're darker. You got more iron content, more magnesium that has come to the surface and cooled. This dark edge you have here where Maria Tranquillitatis is much darker than, than Mare Serenitatis is due to a higher amount of titanium in this region. But when you're looking at these mountains, these aren't, this isn't like like the little hill of grass in your backyard from last year's clippings. This isn't even like the Johnston landfill. I mean, these would be like looking at the Rocky Mountains. These mountains are humongous. I mean, to put this in context, Archimedes Crater here, it's about 55 miles in diameter. And these mountains are much taller than the crater rim of Archimedes Crater. But though this image is really great, you got the, the Terminator right here, which is the sunset line. There is something I want to show you, which is right here. This is called um, Hadley Mons. And if we zoom in on this region, we start seeing some really great detail here. So when we're looking at Hadley Mons, you have this trench that kind of runs right along past this crater right here. This crater is called Hadley Crater, and this trench is called Hadley Rill. Mons or Hadley Mons and Hadley Rill are both visible in the Apollo 15 landing site images. And the Apollo 15 landing site is roughly right about here. And this is fantastic resolution to be looking at this from a telescope that's on Earth. I would expect to see this type of view from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is an observatory that's in orbit around the moon. Now, when you're looking at, you know, the the Hadley region here, you know, the Hadley Rill, Hadley Crater, and then Hadley Peak or Hadley Mons, you notice to the left in Maria Imbrium, you have this really smooth region right here. It's much smoother than the areas around it. And this is a product of, of what we call mare volcanism which is lava flows that actually occurred on the moon. Now, as we scroll down a little bit here and we get into some of the taller peaks along the Mons Apennines, Apennines, you start noticing these little cracks here. You start noticing dramatic shadows along the crater rim. And this is this is a pretty accurate view of that rigorous lunar terrain from quite a distance. When we were running the lab, so this here, this is Cassini Crater. As we were running this lab, we noticed that the very edge of Plato Crater started to become visible. Now, I'm going to 
show you one other region here real fast. So in Maria Vaporum, which is right here, Mayor Vaporum, you have this re relatively deep, almost like a, a like a plateau, and then into some mountains. But then below it, you got this line of craters right here. And these aren't impact craters. These are lava craters. These are lava domes. What you're looking at here is a series of volcanoes where the caldera had collapsed. So this is going back very far in the history of the moon. Now, we're going to switch real quick to another image taken the night after that has a little more detail due to the change in... Let's see if it opens up here. Let me switch it over real fast. So the change in the motion of the Terminator. Yes. When you were zoomed in, Scott, it was evident that there were, you know, some small craters in the Mara or Maria. And how big do you think those would be? So let's take a look at this one right here. One second. <laughs> okay, so are you talking about like like these little craters over in here and these little guys? Yeah, those little ones. So in this case, you're talking. So these are some, these craters are really tiny. These craters are probably about upwards of one mile in diameter. Okay. And you even find craters like this inside the other craters, like we call this sub cratering. Now in this one again, you can see. Hadley Mons, you can see Hadley Rill, you can see Hadley Crater. But in this image, hang on a second, I think I'm still in the wrong one here. I am. I'm going to fix that right now. All right, right here. So in this image, well, not only do we have a wider field, but this is one night later. So the Terminator is not sitting along the edge of the of the of the Montes Apennines or Plato Crater. Now we moved all the way over to what we call Sinus Aridum, known as this. We call this the Bay of Rainbows. In this image, we also have Copernicus Crater, and Archimedes Crater is very visible. Plato Crater has become quite visible as well, and Zooming in on Plato Crater, Plato Crater, you can see a st spectacular amount of detail in the crater rim, subcratering, subcratering here on the rim. And it was drawn, brought to my attention, which is a little upside down tonight, that by my boss at Brown, his name is Bob Horton, really awesome guy, and has actually presented on our live streams in the past, fantastic photographer night photographer he pointed out that over in this area they call this the 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 moon maiden i think is what it's called and if you kind of turn your head to the side i'm gonna like rotate this here a little bit yeah there we go that this is her face this is her hair right here so face hair and this is her body sometimes i can see it Sometimes I feel like it might be like Medusa and these are the snakes. I'm not sure. But I figured I would point that out for all those that are into the pareidolia thing. But one thing I want to note in this image here is, first of all, is Copernicus Crater. So Copernicus Crater is what we call a ray crater. Ray crater means that the ejected matter around the crater is still visible. And I mean, when you look at this here, the ejected matter goes out much further than you would initially expect when you're looking at it. This is a young crater. You know, we're talking 160 million years here. You have substantially different levels of, of internal crater wall. You have a substantial buildup on the outer rim. The rays are still visible. And that bounce back is still visible. These little peaks in the center. I mean, when you look at these peaks, you know, in this case, I see like, it looks like a dinosaur, like a T-Rex, you know, but 
you're looking at a series of mountains that had bounced back when that crater occurred, that impact occurred. And these mountains, to give you an idea the scale of this crater, these mountains are taller than Mount Washington. To give you an idea of the size of this crater rim. But when we step out of this crater, we come over to this crater. This crater here is called Hortensius. And just north of Hortensius Crater, you have these little like mounds that from this view, they look like mounds with holes in the center. And what we're looking at here, these are actually lava domes. These are another product of Mario volcanism where these, you had these almost like volcanoes that formed and the caldera had collapsed. And these are products of some of the past geological activity that occurred in the very early stages of the moon. I had mentioned earlier over here in Maria Vaporum that this is that these are calderas, but I was mistaken. I'm sorry. These are, this is actually a lava tube. This is an old lava tube from Maria volcanism that has collapsed in different regions. And this is the Maria Vaporum region. Now, I'm not going to take over tonight's feed because I can spend the entire night talking about this image. There is so much going on in this image. But I will note real quick that in Maria, Imbri or Maria Imbrium and then Sinus Aridum, right over in this region is where China landed their Jade Rabbit lander, which was the first observatory to land on the moon. And it was uh, a, had a, a rover component that lasted for a couple days. Pretty cool. I have not seen pictures of the moon that crisp ever. <laughs> that wasn't, they weren't from NASA. I know. I, that telescope blows my mind. And yeah. when we're in there giving the labs, in between lab sessions, I'm totally geeking out on the moon. And my one of my colleagues will be there with me and I'll be like, leave me alone. I'm having a moment. <laughs> awesome. All right, so earlier we looked at um, two different uh, face-on galaxies. Um, and the next one I have for you is an edge-on galaxy. Uh, let's see if I can find the button. So this oh, is nice. the Sombrero Galaxy, um, and it is off the top left corner of Corvus um, at about a 45 degree angle, roughly. Um, distance wise, it's probably half the distance across the square off the top of the square. Um, and this one is again in the you know the, the southern sky, so I have to go out to Frosted Drew to be able to capture this because uh, from home, this is in the trees, um, but I think, you know, I was able to capitalize on that uh, Tuesday night uh, and be able to s bring uh, enough data to, you know, have this picture. And what is I this really from like Tuesday about, night? This is from Tuesday night, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, what I really like about this one is you can really see, like, the central bulge is, like, almost spherical, and then it has that, that dust lane around it. Um, and then not much else. Like that's just it. Like some some galaxies, like their dust lane, or is kind of you know uh, diffuse, and it isn't um, very contained. And this one, it just seems like there's a galaxy, a dust ring, and that's it. Um, I'm not sure what type of galaxy this is. I would I would wager uh, that it's some sort of spiral galaxy. Um, so, uh, this one is, is fairly bright and I think it gives you enough that in a telescope you can see like the dark line across that central bulge. Um, uh, but I don't know that you'd be able to resolve any detail other than that. I mean, even in the telescope, it doesn't look like much other than just a, you know, a dark line across a, a bright background. A sombrero. A sombrero, yeah. So, uh, let's see. 
Another example of an edge on galaxy that I've taken in the past. Got a picture of M63, I think it is, which is the black eye galaxy. Where'd you go? This one, 64. So this one's slightly different, um, but it's kind of the, the same thing going on. You've got a very bright core galaxy in the galaxy, and then you have a, a dust lane that sits in front of it. But you can see in this galaxy, we're, we have a different point of view. We're looking at it kind of at an angle. We're not looking at it face on, and we're not looking at it edge on, um, but we're looking at it kind of somewhere in between. And you can see how the dust or, and, the, and the cold gases are sitting on top of or in the way of the central core from our point of view. Um, and I think the kind of the theory on what happened here is this is the results of, of two galaxies that have collided and that gas and dust is kind of offset um, from the, the main like axis of the galaxy. And you can see the spiral arms here are not well defined, and it just kind of looks like kind of a uh, kind of a it's it's really smooth, and there's not any real definition to the spiral arms. Derek, when you're capturing these images, are, are are you using a Barlow of any type? Are you just plugging your sixteen hundred right into that? Eight inch RC. Well, this is just this is just all this is all air all the way to the camera. So I have a a Ritchie Crichton telescope which uses two mirrors, um, and then the camera is sitting on that. So no filters, um, just just the protective glass window in front of the camera um, that the camera uses to keep its uh, you know because it's her hermetically sealed camera. Now is your is your RC is that an astronomics device? Uh, it's Astrotech. Yeah, it's one? astronomics. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but a couple more galaxies from uh, Virgo that we talked about. We talked about M88 uh, and M90 earlier. So in that wide field, M88 was just kind of a, a smudge. Um, but with the, you know, the, the longer telescope, view, uh, you can actually see that that is a galaxy that has, you know, quite a few spiral arms, um, and it's kind of a tightly wound spiral, not a loosely wound spiral, um, but again, That's with fantastic. a central, central core, and I'm not sure if these bright spots are background stars in the Milky Way, or if there's, we're starting to be able to see some of the, like, clustering in the arms of the galaxy there because you can see there's some dim stars here in the background and two bright ones here and those I, stars I would say that some of them might be actual regions of that galaxy where like others like i don't know if you can see my cursor or not no but the no. like just to the right of the galactic nucleus yeah, over like, here up a little bit it's actually like then out to the left a little bit. There you go. I don't think, I don't think that that one right there is. I think that's in the Milky Way. Right, because that looks like it's between two of the arms. Right, but yeah. some of these that are dimmer that are along those arms, I would say that there's a good chance that that's actually right. you're looking at very intense areas of uh, young star formation. Yeah, and that's a fantastic image, Derek. And there's a little background galaxy here that's a. Warped S. And we've been talking at Frosty Drew about putting together the Messier collection. So the Messier catalog is 110 objects. And as you can see, Derek has captured several of these objects. 59. And 50, I mean, that's formidable. Yeah. And, you know, we got a lot of really great imagers at Frosty Drew. And, you know, Derek and I were talking, and so is James. And we're thinking, you know, maybe if Derek, James, Sean, myself, if we all kind of put together an effort, we can put to, we can build a really fantastic, messier collection or or, or uh, in 
that catalog with our own data. And it could be really quite compelling. And I think that's a project we're going to take on starting this year. And we can probably get it done over, over a period of a little bit over a year. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, this is just a, another view of M90, uh, which we saw as a smudge in that wide field. And then in this one, you can see, you know, it has a little bit more definition in the dust lanes. It's a, it's a broader core. Uh, and then, you know, it, you know, just it's, it's in the, it's in the Virgo supercluster field of view. So there's, there's going to be a background galaxy. There's, you know, another one, another one. These are just really small background galaxies. I don't know if you can, yeah, they're showing up on the, 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 the stream yep. here. You know, it's not much more than a smudge, but it's it's not a, a round smudge. So. so, so Derek, why why do your images have X's over the stars? So, um, with most um, mirror-based telescopes, um, they have a primary mirror which is at the bottom of the telescope, and they have a secondary which is at the front of the telescope, but it's facing the the primary. So the light bounces off the primary, hits the secondary and then goes to um, the objective. Um, in order to hold that secondary, they put in supports from the outside of the tube to the secondary holder. Um, the classical arrangement is to have four spokes, and that's what causes those spikes off of the bright stars. Those are diffraction lines from the light interacting with those um, spokes that are holding the, the secondary. Uh, some telescopes have three, and you'll see three spikes. Uh, but not too many commercial telescopes have uh, a, a secondary holder that is held by three supports. Almost all of them are four. <laughs> to figure out some way to optimize this because now that I've got like 50 images on this website it loads slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, another one that I took recently um, this is um, actually this is from a couple nights ago but this is M106 uh, which is it's an unnamed galaxy but it's in the, uh, the area of the sky that's for the in the Big Dipper but what's really interesting about this one is it has a, has a very bright central uh, part not just the core, and then it has a very diffuse um, kind of outer halo. Um, but the two are very, they're warped compared to each other. And I don't i don't know if it really shows up in the image, um, but I think if I was, you know, if we took more data here, you might be able to show some of that perspective. Um, and then you know, as a lot of galaxies and groups go, there's another background galaxy. Um, so. Yeah, it's a lot of galaxies. <laughs> I've been I've been trying to capture a little bit of data on Messier 106 lately at Frosty Drew, that which what you were just showing. But I feel like I think my my RC equalized on me after I had set it all up, and my mm. focus was just slightly out. Yeah, that'll happen. The, the the fun part about astrophotography is you think you're ready and then you're not. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, last night was a perfect example of that where yeah. I rushed out, got all the way down to Frosty Drew, everything set up, alignment done. I was rocking and ready for a fantastic night. I go to take my first calibration image just to make sure I got my field proper and bang fully clouded out and it happened in a matter of like five five minutes yeah. and we were i was like that's great i waited for an hour and then it started to mist james was there with me he heard the complaints <laughs> yeah even tuesday night we were dodging clouds for the first part of the night and then it, it cleared up um about an, an hour before an hour and a half before midnight uh, but it being a work night, I had to, you know, <laughs> fail at midnight. But anyway, um, so this this one I really like, um, and it's it's this is another large galaxy close by. This one's about twelve million light years away, uh, which is about three or four times farther than and the Andromeda galaxy. 
Um, this is Bode's galaxy, and it is another you know classic spiral galaxy. But it, it has a it has a satellite galaxy which is just barely showing up in this image. I'll zoom in on it, and it it's this fuzzy spot here in uh, between these three stars that are a triangle. And what what happened here is these two interacted, and Bode's gal or Bode's galaxy basically stripped everything away from this galaxy. And what's last left is just a collection of you know not a lot. Um, so I think with a lot more data, I can, you know, push the noise floor down far enough to bring that out a little bit or longer exposures. I'm not really sure what's going to bring that out, but, uh, that would hopefully be an improvement for this one. But, you know, because Bode's galaxy is, is so large and close, it again shows us clustering within, you know, the spiral arms. Um, and you can kind of understand, you know, where the star forming regions are and where the young parts of this galaxy are. You have some good dust lanes in there too, like really small ones. Yeah, there's some that are visible. Pretty interesting ones in there. Now are and those they, dust are those dust lanes or are they artifacts of your processing? They shouldn't be that's, those are, that's clearly dust lane, right? Yeah, there. that's that's dust lane. Um I I try to limit the amount of processing that I do. It's basically just a simple stretch, some contrast curves, and that's that's kind of where I leave it. Um, personal preference. No, yeah, that resolution though is fantastic. And now, then, so you got you got relatively low noise going here. How how many sub images are you are you using in these? I, I try to get an hour, which is thirty images, two two minutes each image. Um, you usually have to throw out about five, so it's fifty minutes of data, and then. Um, but a lot of these um, are even less than that. They're, they're 15 images because I just didn't spend a whole hour collecting that night on a particular object. Um, but it's all wideband. There's no, there's no filters. It's, it's IR through UV just captured on a monochrome camera. This one is... The, it's it's very close to M81, and in a in a wider field, you can actually resolve. You can see both of them. Um, this one is also interacting with M81 uh, gravitationally, but it, it didn't it didn't actually like collide. It's just a gravitational interaction. The tidal forces from M81 are causing huge amounts of star formation in this relatively small galaxy. Um, and there's also something else going on because there's a jet that shoots out of the top and bottom of this um, galaxy, and it looks like kind of a helix. And you, you can start to see it um, yep. here. And I, again, I, I would need more data to be able to pull that out. Um, but back, I think in 2014 or 2016, there was a supernova. 2014. MM82. And... That was when I was first getting into astrophotography. So um, that that picture, <laughs> you you can see a a blob with a bright spot in it, and that's that's about it. But you know, everybody gets better, um, so that's that's pretty cool. But I do have a picture uh, over here of M sixty one, which had a supernova last year. I need to update my picture because I've since learned that I marked the wrong star. Um, but I'll point out which one's the right star <laughs> when we get there. So, um, so M M61 is uh, a barred spiral galaxy. Uh, and last year it, it had a supernova, which, um, is the SN 2020 JFO. And it's actually this star, uh, that is the Nova. Uh, supernova, and I think I got them confused because uh, the reference picture I was looking at was flipped over compared to this one, and it's pretty easy if you're trying to line three stars up, you, you swap which one is the actual supernova. But if you think about what's going on here, you've got this central core of this galaxy, which is thousands to millions of stars, like collectively producing light that comes to the camera, and it, you know it saturates it. And then you've got, you know, these, these star forming regions or young stars, which are kind of the brighter spots in these arms. And those look a little brighter, 
And then you have this one individual star that blew up, produced so much light that it's outshining some of the stars that are in our local Milky Way galaxy. Um, it's, it's a phenomenal amount of light that is generated and energy for that matter during a super, supernova event. I think this was a type 1A supernova. Yep. Yeah, which is one it's it's one of the most um, sought or not sought after but in in the classes of supernovas it's it's got a very predictable light curve so we can use it for some um, precise scientific measurements uh, with regard to distance so all right let's see I don't know, is anybody watching the uh, chat? I don't know if we've had any questions come in. Right. We're watching it. Not much going on in the chat tonight. Fair enough. So this one, um, I didn't I didn't mark the actual object, so you'll have to forgive me while I... Uh, this is M60. Um, and what's cool about M60 is it has a nearby... So M60 is this elliptical galaxy that doesn't have a whole lot of definition. Um, and then it has a fairly close companion, at least optically. I don't know how close these are together um, other than their visual distance. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's a spiral next to an elliptical galaxy. And then over here, you've got a fairly bright lenticular galaxy, which is really bright, but kind of oblong. <laughs> Kind of a nice grouping there, and again, that's in that Virgo supercluster um, wide field as well. Let's see, Derek, your messier catalog is quite impressive. <laughs> uh, well, every day I try to add to it. Let's see. There was another one that I had that I wanted to show you guys. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. But let's let's go through this one because this one's kind of a, an oddball as well. Um, so you've got this is M ninety four and it's it's underneath the body of Leo about halfway down. Um, it's it's to the west of the Leo triplet, if you know where that is off the tail of Leo. Um, and this one's a little weird. It it has this like dark ring inside of the galaxy and then there is this like faint halo around the outside so it it, it just doesn't fit into like your classical you know, galaxy structures which is kind of you know it's it's pretty cool like you know there's there's 95 percent of galaxies are you know classified into you know five or six different categories and then you've got these things which are just doing just oddball things and it's usually because of interactions with other galaxies um, and some of the close by galaxies why chrome do you refresh this every time you know they they, they some of the nearby galaxies also have some oddball shapes um, so you get this barred spiral galaxy, but the spirals are so tight that they make a circle around the core. <laughs> and then, then this one also has kind of a, a weak halo around it as well. So. It's kind of interesting to think about like all the different galaxy shapes. Um, so sometimes I'm asked, what does our galaxy look like? Um, and we... We have been trying to figure that out for a very long time <laughs> as, uh, as we do try to figure things out. And, oh, that's not, that's not the one I want. Um, the current theory is that the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy um, with four arms, uh, two old arms, and then two arms that are a little bit younger, or quite a bit younger. Um, I had a picture of a galaxy that was sort of like that. 
And I was going to show you guys. This might be it. Mm, no. All right. I'll have to While figure you're that out. Finding the picture. Um, we got um, two questions from the chat. One is from Nate, and he asked, "How long does a supernova last visually to be seen through a telescope?" And the other one is from Ken, and he asked, "Is Derek a real person or an, or an AI character?" Derek's an AI character, totally. Yep. Been working and you can't on ask him questions like that. I've been working that can on my, break the programming. I've been working on my program for you know thirty plus years. Um, so supernova, in the case of um, a type 1A supernova, you can see it visually for probably a month. It has it is a ramp up period, and then it has a decay period that then flattens out and plateaus for a while, um, and then it and then that slowly decays back to nothing. Um, so what ends up ha causing a type 1a supernova or, or at least the theory that i understand and have read is you've got two stars in a binary um setup and one is siphoning material from the other star so it's growing um and when it gets to a certain threshold i fail to remember the name of that threshold um chandra it, car mass thank you <laughs> <laughs> it detonates um the pressures inside of the star get to the get to a critical threshold and that star detonates so all of the material or a large portion of the material that form that star um fuse very quickly um and that f helps form elements that are heavier than iron um classical star fusion can only fuse up to about the iron element. And that would be in very large stars. Um, and so what's interesting if you think about that is we have elements on earth that are heavier than iron. So all of the material on earth that's heavier than iron was born in some type of supernova. So we exist today because of a supernova or several. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, it's, you know, this hugely destructive event, um, but it's necessary for, you know, the creation of elements that are heavier than iron. Neutron capture. Pretty cool. I don't know if you've got anything else, Scott. Yeah, sure. All right. So let's see here. I have a few things to show. So first of all, James, do you have anything you want to show? Oh, that's right. James joined us. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm actually on the way to the FDO right now in the car. So I was just kind of more so listening in. But when I get there, uh, I'm sure I could bring up a couple things on my phone. Is it is it still cloudy where you are? Oh, man. There's like a dense fog. But I had somebody mm. take a train for New Hampshire down so uh, I almost feel like obligated to at least like kind of go and demo at least uh, the settings and so forth James is our resident optimist he when when he sees a forecast for clouds or fog he's like I don't buy that I'm going out anyway yes you know because I don't know every once in a while you'll get lucky but uh, you know for this occasion because it's a paid occasion you know I almost feel obligated all right, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put up this real quick. This wasn't initially what I was going to show, but I'm going to show this image because this is something that we're just about to, to lose in the wintertime sky. Oh, well, now that the wintertime's over, this is leaving our sky. So what we see here in this image, this is largely the, this is the left star in Orion's belt. This is the center star in Orion's belt. This star is called Alan Attack. This star is called Alan Alam. And this is the, the Orion molecular cloud complex. And this is on its way out. But in this image here, this is in the center, the Horsehead Nebula that we're looking at right here. 
And let's see if we can rotate this a little bit so it looks a little more like we would expect it to see. And this is one of the de facto objects in the constellation Orion. Now, we've seen images of the horse head year after year coming from different telescopes. It's a very popular object to photograph. It's very difficult to observe visibly in a telescope. And the reason is because you're not looking at a nebula that's actually illuminated. What you're looking at is a dark nebula that is closer to us than the nebula that is actually casting light, which is behind it. So this region right here, you're looking at, and this is largely a cloud of hydrogen gas. You know, it's the most common element in the universe, but in this case, this hydrogen gas is being ionized by all of the ultraviolet light coming out of Allen attack. This ionization process, you, know, you got hydrogen atom, it gets struck by ultraviolet radiation, blast an electron off of it, and I have a hydrogen ion, a, it's a hydrogen atom with a negative charge. And those free-flowing electrons are moving around, and that hydrogen ion is trying to reconnect, and eventually it will reconnect with another electron, not the same one, but another one. And when that happens, it gets excited and it glows. And as it returns to a restful state is when we see it or ground state. All of that emission, which is why we call it an emissions nebula, is behind the, this dark nebula right here, this cloud of cold hydrogen gas. It's not interacting with starlight, and it creates a silhouette. Now, it's known as the horse head because it looks like a horse head right here, but in a way, I kind of see like the headless horseman, you know, it's like the body here and the arms and no head. And then it's kind of like the horses in the cloud here. Or I see like a lurking figure. But this region is just loaded with so many amazing events. I mean, you have these reflection nebulae here. These are stars that are inside this, this cloud of hydrogen gas that are illuminating the hydrogen gas. This is the flame nebula which is largely, again, a product of Allen attacks ultraviolet radiation. And this is in the constellation Orion. So get your last look as we kiss this region goodbye for the coming spring viewing. But I also want to show you guys an image of... Go back here real quick. James and I were talking about this the other night. The, the row of Fiaki cloud complex. So just now we got the Milky Way rising. And as the Milky Way rises, we start seeing that, you know, the galactic nucleus, we start seeing a lot of that really excellent features that sit along the galactic plane. And the row of Fiaki is cloud complex is one of those sought after images in astrophotography. So first I'm gonna bring up just the regular image that I have of it that has already been released. So this here is the lower region of the row of Fiaki cloud complex. This is the bright star Antares. This is the messier four open star cluster. And Rho Phaicus is right here. Now, this is a mix of, of dark nebulae, cold hydrogen gas that is closer to us than the interaction. Uh, you got a reflection nebula here from a red giant star Antares. You have ionization of hydrogen gas in a, hydro in a molecular hydrogen cloud. But the upper region, which is not in this image, contains something that we call the Blue Horsehead Nebula. And I'll show you that right now. So the Blue, the blue Horsehead Nebula, and this is, image has not been released yet, and it's not fully processed at this time. So I want to show it tonight because it really is 
rather impressive. Now, this is a project in the works. Keep that in mind as you look at this. But this here is what we consider that the blue horse head. And this is at the very upper region of the row of Phaicus cloud complex. In this region, again, you have a lot of hydrogen gas, but this hydrogen gas is very weakly interacting with ultraviolet light and the stars that are in it. It's interacting so weakly that most of it appears as just dark nebula. You got a little bit of emissions happening in here, but largely you see the blues, which are all reflection nebula, which is just bright, visible starlight reflecting off the nebula. And these stars are quite high mass stars. So they're casting a, a, a significant amount of blue light into the gas cloud. This star here is a little bit cooler. It's definitely more in the white spectrum. And it's got a little bit of a white reflection nebula around it. But we're just about to continue this project at Frosty Drew because this object is just about to become visible. And the reason I, I put this up tonight is because James and I were talking about this last night in between our complaints about the clouds. And it really is such a fantastic region to observe. And we haven't had a chance all winter to take a look at this. Now, James is much more ambitious than I am. I wait until late April before I start even thinking about getting out there and working on this region. And this is probably the earliest I'll even consider talking about it. James, on the other hand, he's out there in like February looking at this right before the sun rises down at like Point Judith or Ninigrit Pond. So he doesn't, he doesn't fool around with this. But one other object I wanted to show as well here, and this kind of goes on top of what Derek has been showing. So Derek has been putting up some fantastic images tonight of some of these galaxies. And I have similar images that are a little bit older than the ones that Derek had captured, but in color. So this image right here, this is what Derek showed earlier, which was Bodhi's galaxy, so known as Messier 81. And this is the same thing Derek had, just in this case, we have color. And what we're looking at here is, again, these spiral arms, but the blue regions of the spiral arms all represent very young stars. These are recently formed stars, where around the central or the galactic nucleus, you have some of that yellow, which is the older stars. Again, just, just like Derek's image, you can faintly see the satellite galaxy right here. And then I also have 64, the black eye that Derek had up. And the black eye galaxy is, actually I have several of them. Let me go find more of a recent one here. The black eye galaxy really is quite a fantastic galaxy because of a couple of reasons. One, what Derek was describing, you know, we have a galaxy here that what we're looking at is two galaxies that have actually come together. And we're seeing the second galaxy not fully integrated into the primary galaxy right here. But something really notable about Messier 64 is that we have never observed a supernova that has occurred in this galaxy. Now we see extragalactic supernovae all the time. Usually they're type 1a supernova as Derek was describing earlier. But with Messier 64, we're yet to see a supernova happen. And when you look at Messier 64, unlike a lot of the other galaxies we've been looking at, you notice that there's not a lot of clustering. You don't see a lot of those star forming regions everywhere, but you do see a lot of blues which is representative of very young stars that are in these spiral arms. So this galaxy has a lot of interesting things happening. It definitely has spirals. It definitely looks lenticular. And it is definitely interacting with another galaxy, so we'd expect it to be starburst. But what we see is kind of a, yeah, maybe it's all that, but maybe not. Definitely an interesting galaxy. 
Now, I know that we're reaching the end of our broadcast here, so I didn't know where Derek wanted to take the broadcast at this point. I'm going to check to see if I was muted before I started talking. Um, I mean, I usually try to keep it to an hour um, just because that's usually all I've got uh, prepared for. Um, if we had some questions to kind of drive us, we might be able to continue going, but I don't think any questions have come in. There uh, has been discussions about the llama that Unity brought into my my uh, into our music room, which is where I'm sitting tonight, and decided to smack me in the head with. Oh, I, I missed that. Yeah, you did. It. You should have seen it. I'm not sure where that what that llama means. It seemed a little demonic to me. You're like demon llama. Oh my god! But gotta it's watch in the out. house. You gotta watch out for those llama. Yeah. Whenever I see a llama, I think of that that old, rather lesser known Disney movie called The Emperor's New Groove. When <laughs> when that when he's like the llama gets up and he's talking, and the other guy's like a John Goodman's like Demon Llama, and the llama's like Demon Llama, and looks at the other llama, and it takes off running. So, <laughs> Mara clearly knows what I'm talking about here. <laughs> It's such a great movie. It is. I love it. So. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. So I think uh, we'll probably wrap up here tonight. Um, and we hope to see everybody out at Frosty Drew uh, when the weather is better. Uh, the plan for these throughout the year is to do them in the first hour that we are at Frosty Drew. Um, just to kind of generate some interest. Um, and then, uh, you know, from there, we'll continue doing our normal uh, program at Frosty Drew. Um, and hopefully this turns out to be a really cool thing for the Frosty Drew. And uh, we get some, uh, you know, good following. So thank you for coming tonight. And uh, hope everybody has a good weekend. See you guys later. All right, we're off.